no one individual gene is responsible for math abilities. But the question is, do genetics influence your mathematical abilities? To answer that, we need to know if we are born with a sense of numbers, or if it's something that starts to develop only when we learn simple arithmetic. In order to answer this question, we need to go back to our infancy. In a 2016 study, researchers asked themselves, are babies born with a kind of number sense that will predict how good they will be at math later on? This gives you a clue as to whether there is any kind of inheritability to mathematical skill. Researchers sat down six-month-old infants in front of two picture streams. On the left side, when each frame changed, the number of dots stayed the same every time, always 10 dots, though they varied in size and arrangement. On the right side, the number of dots kept switching and would also vary in size. Both sides flashed in rhythm, so the only difference was whether the numbers stayed constant or changed. With special cameras, researchers would detect eye movement and the amount of time spent looking at each screen. The thought was, if babies can sense changes in quantity, they should prefer looking at the side where the number keeps changing. The amount of extra time they spend looking at that side gives a numerical preference score, which is a measure of their approximate number system acuity, which we'll call ANS acuity, or their raw number sense. After completing the test, they were given scores. If a baby stared more at the changing number stream, they got a higher positive score. If they didn't really notice or preferred the constant stream, their score was closer to zero or negative. The assumption was that the children with a higher score will be better at math when they age. They came back to the children when they were three and a half years old and had them take two more tests to see whether their prediction was correct. In the first, they saw two dot groups and had to choose which had more dots and got a score expressed as a Weber fraction. A small Weber fraction, or closer to zero, means they could tell apart even very similar quantities. For example, 10 versus 12, which means that they had better acuity. A large Weber fraction, or closer to one, means they only noticed big differences. For example, 10 versus 20, so had worse acuity. So essentially, lower numbers equals sharper number sense. This table shows their scores combined. Remember, on the x-axis, the more positive, the better their perception. And on the y-axis, the lower, the better their math scores at three and a half years. This line tells us that on average, the better a baby's number sense, the stronger their later math skills. We'll come back to this graph later, but first I want to tell you guys about the second test. The children took the test of early mathematics ability, which is a widely used standardized math exam for preschoolers. The raw results are converted into a standardized score. Scores around 100 mean average for that age. Higher scores indicate stronger early math skills, like counting, number facts, and basic arithmetic. And lower scores mean weaker math ability for their age. Essentially, higher numbers equals better math performance. This table shows their scores combined. The upward slope of the line means that the more a baby preferred number changes, the higher their math scores later. Let's take a look at the table side by side. We can see that on average, the prediction of the researchers was true. Indeed, the babies with a better number sense tended to be better in math later on. But the thing is, the tendency is not very strong, and even the researchers acknowledge that. It's fair to say that some people are born with a sharper number sense, and on average, those individuals are more likely to perform better at math when they grow up. But the thing is, this trend is pretty modest, and there are many exceptions, because genetics is more of a contributing factor than a determinant. But has anyone ever tested how much genetics influence mathematical ability versus environment? Fortunately, yes, in a twin study that Sophia will tell you guys about. The nice thing about twins is that identical twins, which the study labeled MZ, essentially share 100% of their DNA. Fraternal twins, labeled DZ, share about 50% of their segregating DNA. 
The final results included the participation of 5,348 individuals, all of whom were 10 years old. The hypothesis was that if identical twins are more similar in math performance than fraternal twins, then there's a clear and significant influence of genetics. All the twins took a math test aligned with the UK national curriculum, and it covered, first, understanding number, so numerical and algebraic processes. Two, non-numerical processes. So mathematical processes and concepts such as rotational or reflective symmetry and other spatial operations. And three, computation and knowledge. So calculation ability and recall of mathematical facts and terms. And the results were summed into a composite score. This table shows the results of how similar the answers were between each set of twins in each subject. Remember, MZM stands for identical male twins, DZ for fraternal males. Same for the other two categories, but F for female. And OP means fraternal, one male and one female. The N represents the number of twin pairs. In general, identical twins had higher concordance rates, which means they scored more similarly with each other than fraternal twins did. We put a lot of effort into our videos, so we would really appreciate if you could subscribe to the channel and like this video. So the results were pretty similar, especially between identical twins. But what these tables don't tell us is how much of that similarity is because of their genes or because of their environment. The results are obviously not only influenced by the genes because the siblings were also raised together. The explanation of how that was measured is a teeny bit complicated. So we won't discuss the details here because that would take way too long. But if you would like to know the precise answer to that, we've linked to the research paper in the description. So let's just discuss the results. These are three categories of influence. Genetic, so DNA, shared environment, like same parents, same housing, etc. And non-shared environment, so different teachers, friends, hobbies, and so on. Overall, genetics alone explained about half of the variance in understanding number, computation and knowledge, and the overall math composite. For non-numerical processes, genetics was very small and not statistically significant, so spatial-like reasoning is a lot more influenced by your environment. The shared environment was significant for non-numerical processes and the composite, but it was not significant for understanding number or computation and knowledge. And the non-shared environment, including error, was significant for all outcomes. Okay, we've given you a lot of numbers, but essentially the conclusion is this. In general, both genetics and environment play an important role in your math level. But here's an interesting detail. The kids were separated into those that scored better than 85% of the others. Is there any difference between them and those others, whether genetic or environmental? No. There was no meaningful difference in influence. So the outcome is that everyone, whether they're good at math or not, are influenced by the same proportion of genetics and environment. The study is the first of its kind, so it only serves as an indicator of what determines our math abilities. So to answer our initial question, whether genetics influence our math ability, the answer is yes, they do, but to an extent. If you're watching this video and you like math, chances are your genetics probably favor it, since you enjoy it. In terms of success in the field of math, remember that only some of it is genetics. That leaves the other part up to the environment and up to your effort. But that's not all. None of these studies showed the influence of hard work and the effect it had on their math skills. It mostly measured genetic influence without any extra effort. So none of these actually compare hard work with natural talent. There are many studies that show that with enough determination, anyone can succeed in becoming better at a subject, despite any possible disadvantages. But in any case, did you know that it actually matters whether you believe that you can become better at math or if you believe that the outcome is fixed? In one study, researchers followed 373 students across 7th and 8th grade. One group believed that intelligence is malleable, called incremental theory. The other, that it is fixed and predetermined, or entity theory. Both groups started out at similar grade levels. Each point represents the average for each group. The y-axis represents their math grades in percentage. The x-axis is the time from the fall of 7th grade through the spring of 8th grade, a total of 2 years. Watch how they progressed. 
the incremental group, or the growth mindset group, steadily increased their average across 7th and 8th grade. Entity group, or the fixed mindset, had their grades stay flat or even slightly decline, ending around 71. Essentially, this tells us that if you believe intelligence can grow, you keep improving. But if you believe intelligence is fixed, you actually decline. And that's not all. In a second study, the same researchers randomly assigned 91 students to two groups and held one session a week with them for a total of eight weeks. The experimental group, where they were taught that intelligence can grow through effort via lessons, activities, and discussions like, you can grow your intelligence. And the control group learned about memory techniques like note-taking strategies, organization skills, and task preparation tips. Notice that these skills don't challenge students' beliefs about intelligence. They assume intelligence is fixed, and the best you can do is manage your study habits. Well, here are the results. In the y-axis were the students' actual math grades on the GPA scale. On the x-axis, we have time 1, which is what the grade point average was when they started, before intervention. Time 2 represents a check of how they were doing right at the beginning of the intervention, before starting the first class. The average of both groups' grades declined slightly, but that's actually a normal trend in middle school. And by time 3, after the intervention, the experimental grades rose, while the grades of the control group actually kept going down. The conclusion from both studies is that just by believing that you can do better at math if you work hard actually makes you better at math, whether you are originally good at it or not. To give you guys an expression, even if you aren't born a Mozart or a genius, it doesn't mean you can't play the piano. With enough practice, you may become just as great. In any case, modern math doesn't progress because of geniuses. Advancements in math come from decades and sometimes centuries of cumulative achievements of different mathematicians. And if you enjoy doing math, it's worth doing it just for that alone. Not to mention all the benefits your brain will be reaping from it. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there!